Good morning. And let me welcome you this morning to our services here at Central. We are glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, let me say we're especially pleased to have you. We hope you'll feel at home and welcomed. Uh, we want you to feel that way, and we want you to know we're glad that you've come. So we're going to ask for your help with something in order to, to make that happen, to let you know we're glad you're here. Let me ask you, if you would, if you're a guest, to notice that in the pew ahead of you is a welcome card. If you would take that and fill it out, and then at the end of the service, just put it in the offering boxes at the back of the sanctuary. We would appreciate that very, very much. Uh, we'd like to just send you a little letter, let you know we're glad that you come. Open up a door of communication. If you're watching online, the same thing. We have a connect card on our website. Um, so whether you're online or in person, we, we want you to know that we're glad you're joining us for worship. Now, it is important that we seek God's blessing on this day. And I think it's going to be a great day. I really do. So let's stop. And let's just pray right now and commit the service to him, okay? Would you join me? Heavenly Father, how grateful we are to be able to call you our God. Lord, it, it doesn't enhance your reputation for us to say that you're our God. But Lord, what we really are thankful for this morning is that you have said we're your children. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for the, the love that you've shown us, the grace that you've shown us, the faithfulness that you've shown us. Lord, the list goes on and on. We could never begin to repay you for all you've done for us. But Lord, we do want to be thankful. And so we want to express our thanks to you this morning for that, for your goodness to us. Lord, I pray specifically for everyone who's here that this day they would hear from you, that they'd be able to worship you and experience your presence in a new and a fresh way. Lord, we're so grateful that your mercies are new and fresh every morning and we're so thankful, Father, for the privilege that we have to be able to commune with you this morning. I pray, Father, that every one of us here would hear from you, and we commit the service to you to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. Scott? Good morning. Let's stand together and sing. King of Kings. The ladies start us off, and the ladies have all these verses in this song. I know you know the song by now, so sing it out, ladies, right? Lead us. Here we go, ladies. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, everybody together. Praise the Father, praise the Son.
all together and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in all for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame down this gospel truth of And the church said, amen to that. You may be seated.
battle was still raging Not all prisoners of war had come home These were battlefields of my own making See, I didn't know that the war had been won Oh, then I heard that the king of the ages He had fought all life's battles for me And victory, victory was mine song for the last couple weeks. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be magnified Were the whole earth echoing His evidence? His name would burst from sea and sky From rivers to the mountain tops We'd hear Christ be magnified We practiced these parts last week, let me hear you sing them Let's fill this place with praise. Let's try this verse together. When every creature finds its inmost melody And every human heart its native cry Oh, then in one in rapture hymn of praise We'll sing Christ be magnified Bye. 
Sounds good. Let's just keep that praise going this morning. I won't bow to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. If it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice cause you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Cause death is just a doorway into resurrection life. If I join you in your sufferings, then I'll this morning. May He be magnified in your life and in mine. Let's continue singing with Run to the Father.
the church said, amen. I want to ask you to take your Bible and turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to think this morning about the pattern for perfect peace in an imperfect world. It's a crazy world we live in. I think all of us would agree to that. Um, so many norms have changed. So many things are going on. And uh, you just, if you watch the news, just seem like you're almost Don Quixote, just battling a, a windmill of different issues that are coming up in our, our day and age. It's, it's a fascinating time. And I heard a story years ago that I think probably kind of sums up how I feel about it. It was a story of a, a bricklayer, actually, who had gotten hurt on the job and uh, was applying for a, uh, a time off so he could rest and recuperate. And in order to get that time off, he had to write a report about what had happened. And this is what he said. He said he had left too many bricks on top of a building, and he had to go get them. Uh, so he rigged a contraption with a pulley and a rope fixed to the top of the building. He went down to the ground and fixed the rope to the end of a barrel and hoisted it to the roof. He went up on the roof, filled the barrel with bricks, went back down to the ground and untied the rope. He said at that moment he perceived that the barrel of bricks was heavier than he was. And so when the barrel started down, he started up, but he did not have the presence of mind to let go of the rope until it was too late. He said the barrel came hurtling down and hit him on the shoulder, giving him a severe laceration. But he managed to hold on and went all the way to the top and wedged his fingers in the pulley. He said when he hit the top, the barrel hit the ground. And the bottom came out, depositing the bricks on the ground, thereby making the barrel lighter than him. <laughs> now, he said, I started down and the barrel started up. And again, we met halfway. This time, the barrel gave me another severe uh, wound on the shins, but I managed to hold on till I hit the ground and fell upon, of all things, that pile of sharp cornered bricks. He said, it was then that I lost my presence of mind, let go of the rope, and the barrel came down and hit me on the head. <laughs> I have felt that way, and I'm sure you have too. We don't know whether we're going up or down. We're getting hit from every side. You know, you don't know whether to let go or hold on. I mean, you don't know what to do. It's, it is a crazy world out there. But I want you to know something. In the Lord, we have something that the world does not have, and that is a beautiful, mind-bending peace that only God can give, and the world can't even begin to understand it. A perfect peace in a very imperfect world. Now, what is the key to this peace? As you look at the passage that we're going to read, I want you to keep the word thing in mind. So let's begin Philippians chapter 4 in verse 4. And notice that Paul wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for no thing, for nothing, but in everything. Now catch that, everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there be any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, there's a word that just stands out in this passage. It's the word thing. And if you want to know what real peace is all about, it is you having a proper relationship with things. Because there are things that come into our lives. Some things we can't help. Most things, honestly, we can't help. And especially those things that end up causing us anxiousness, worry. Uh, somebody just handed me a slip a moment ago that said, worry is the devil's way of saying, thank you for listening. There's a lot of truth in that. Uh, you know, we just have things that come our way and they make us anxious. They keep us off balance. But I believe what this passage would teach us this morning is that if we have a healthy balance between our God and the things that come our way, we will have a peace that the world just cannot understand. 
And frankly, my friend, neither will you. You'll never be able to figure out how God can give you perfect peace in an imperfect world. Now, there are five things that I want us to things that I want us to keep in mind as we look at this text this morning. I want you to notice, first of all, that Paul would say, worry about no thing. Worry about nothing. Notice, if you would, how he said in verse 6, be anxious for nothing. So you worry about no thing. Now, you say, that's easy for you to say, Roland. You know, you're in semi-good health, and uh, you're not an executive in some corporation that, that has an accounts payable, uh, that you have to come up with money for every week. Uh, maybe I'm not a teenager living in a home with overbearing parents. I mean, a lot of things, uh, Roland, you know, you just don't have to put up with that I don't have to put up with. Let me remind you something. It's not your pastor saying this in the pulpit. It is Paul saying this from a Roman jail cell. The man who said, be anxious for nothing, was chained to a Roman guard in a dank, dark prison. It's not me saying that. This is what God says. Be anxious for nothing. Now, there are two or three things that I would share with you about worry. The best thing you can say about worry is it's wasteful. You waste time and effort and energy on things that you can do nothing about. It is wasteful. Now, Worry never solved a problem. Worry never dried a tear. Worry never uh, lifted a burden. And you know what Jesus said about that? He said, which one of you, by worrying, could add one inch to your stature, to your height? Your worrying will not help you. The best you can say is it's wasteful. Uh, you know, somebody gave a little ditty years ago, and I don't remember where I heard this, but it, it is true. For every evil under the sun, there's either a cure or else there is none. If there be one, seek till you find it. If there be none, never mind it. And that's the way we have to approach this thing. You don't worry about anything. If you can do something about it, do it. But if you can't do anything about it, it's absolutely beyond your control, don't worry about it. Now, the, <laughs> the best you can say is it, is it is wasteful, but something that is worse is that it is harmful to you. It will take its toll on you. If you worry, it will affect you both emotionally, physically, and spiritually. It is harmful to you. Worry is like sand in machinery. Uh, it doesn't have a happy ending. It just doesn't go well. There's an old fable that was told of a man who one day saw a, a sinister figure going into town. And he said, where are you going? What are you going to do? And he said, I'm going into this town. I'm going to kill a thousand people. <laughs> a few days later, the same man saw this evil figure coming out of town, and he said, your math is not real good. You said you were going to kill 1,000, 10,000 people died, to which he said, I killed 1,000. Fear killed the other 9,000. I wonder how many of us will end up in the grave before we have to because we are worried, we are fearful, we are anxious. We are concerned about things over which we can do nothing, and I wonder if it won't lead to our early death. It is harmful to you emotionally, physically, spiritually. Because, you see, not only is worry um, harmful and wasteful, but it is also a sin. This text is not a suggestion. This is a command. When the Scripture says, be anxious for nothing, that is a command. It's not just a good idea. You see, worry says to God, God, I can't trust you. And God wants us to learn to trust him in everything. And worry says, God, I, I can't, I can't trust you. <laughs> Jesus said in, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, people worry about all these things. And he said, if you worry about them, you're acting like the Gentiles act, like the pagans act. You see, it's just unchristian to worry. That's the way the world handles it. And we are twice born people living in a world of once born people. We're to be different. We're not to be like them. It is actually sinful. I remember hearing of a guy who, uh, who, <laughs> who was a worrier. Now, you probably have known some people like this. I have met them. In fact, uh, I, I had a dear friend when we lived in Mississippi whose name was Lonzo Myers. Lonzo was a worrier. He worried all the time. Every time you saw him, he had a frown on his face. He was always worried. In fact, he told me one time, this is absolutely true. He said, you know something, Roland? He said, when I'm not worried, I worry about why I'm not worried. <laughs> now, folks, you're in a mess when you feel that way. That literally happened. 
When I'm not worried, I worry about why I'm not worried. A lot of people feel that way. One man was that way. He went around constantly down and, and out. He just was always negative. And all of a sudden, there was a wonderful change that took place in his life. He started smiling. He didn't complain. All of his friends noticed it. And they said, what in the world has happened to you? He said, it's the best news you can imagine. He said, I met a man who I could hire to do my worrying for me. He said, uh, he said I, I employed his services. And he said, now, whatever comes my way, I just send it to him and tell him, worry about it. He said, it has been great. It has relieved me of an incredible burden. The man said, that is a good idea. He said, how much does that cost? He said, it costs $1,000 a week. His buddy said, well, you can't afford that. He said, that's his worry. <laughs> wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be great if there was somebody that you could just hire to carry all your worries, that you could just, now hear me, cast all your worries upon? There is someone, and he won't cost you $1,000 a week. It's absolutely free. It's a part of being in the family. You see, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, the apostle Peter said, cast all your cares upon him, upon the Lord, because he cares for you. And by the way, when you hand that to the Lord and you say, here, Lord, here's something for you to worry about, I hope you know he doesn't worry. God's not worried about it at all. I like what Corey Ten Boom said. She said, there is no panic in heaven, only plans. God's not worried about what's going on. And you... Casting your burden upon him is not going to increase his worry load, but it will sure lighten yours. And that's what we're told to do. We do have someone we can cast our burdens upon and cast our worries upon. His name is the Lord Jesus. And so you worry about no thing. You say, well, that's great. How do you do that? Glad you asked. The way you can do that is by number two, pray about all things. You pray about everything. Now, a lot of times we worry, well, I, you know, I can understand bringing the big stuff to God, but what about the little stuff? Do we really need to waste this time? In fact, one lady, one lady asked um, G. Campbell Morgan, who, if you don't know of G. Campbell Morgan, he was an expositor uh, of the Word of God uh, in another generation, a previous generation. This lady asked him, Dr. Morgan, should we really bring our little burdens to the Lord? And he answered her with the, with the question, he said, ma'am, do you have any problem that's a big problem to God? Anything? We don't have any problem that's a big problem to God. I mean, all of our worries are small to him, and he is awesome. He can do anything. He is not limited in any form or fashion. And so when we bring our worries to him, we're, we're in good shape because he's big enough to handle it. Now, we know these truths, don't we? Sometimes we just have to be reminded of these things. In fact, we've sung these truths for many years. Do you remember the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus? all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what needless, um, uh, oh, what peace we often forfeit. There's the phrase. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. We've sung that. It's based on Scripture. God says, worry about nothing, but pray about everything. You see, the place of prayer is not, the only, is not only the place of provision and the place of power. It's also the place of peace. That's why we're told to bring those things to him. I met God in the morning when the day was at its best, and his presence came like sunrise, like a glory to my breast. All day long, the presence lingered. All day long, he stayed with me, and we sailed in perfect calmness o'er a very troubled sea. Other ships were blown and battered. Other ships were sore distressed. But the winds that seemed to drive them brought to me peace and rest. Then I thought of other mornings with a keen remorse of mind when I too had loosed the moorings with the presence left behind. So I think I know the secret. Learn from many a troubled way. You must seek him in the morning if you want him during the day. You know, we'd be well off to start every day with our elbows on the windowsill of heaven looking up to the throne. Pray about all things. There are no big, little, big things to God. There are no little things to God. They're just things, and we're instructed to bring them to him. Thirdly, 
be thankful for everything. He says, with thanksgiving in verse eight, or excuse me, verse seven, six, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplications with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. With thanksgiving. You see, we're to learn to be thankful for everything. We ought to come to God every day and thank God, even for the problems that come our way. I think it was Billy Sunday, if I remember correctly, who said we ought to, in our prayer life, pull out a few groans and put in a few hallelujahs. It just changes your attitude. You see, you come to God asking him to help you with these things. That's saying please. But if you know your manners, not only do you say please, you also say thank you. And so when we ask him for things, we need to thank him. You see, that's what praise is all about. That's what thanksgiving is all about. It is, it is the, uh, the inside out of, of seeking God for things. It's the, the flip side of the coin. When you ask him for something, thank him that he's going to do it. We'll say, somebody will say, well, pastor, it's easy to thank God for the good things, but, but I can't thank him for those bad things. Hmm. You don't thank him because he brings you only good things. You thank him because God is good. There are things that are not good. Cancer is not good. Rape, death, thievery, all these things are not good. And we don't thank God for those things. We thank God because God is good. And he has said that all things work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Even though God brings and allows things that are bad to come into our lives, God has a way of taking those things and mixing them together and making something good out of it. God doesn't say that everything that happens to you is good. And you don't thank him for the, the bad things. You thank him that because even in the bad things, God is still good. And somehow he can use that in your life to make you a better believer. And in the process, he gives you peace along the way. I remember uh, thinking about Romans eight twenty eight. That's the verse for all. And we know it's not a hope. It's not just wishing. And we know that all things work together for good. Not everything is good. I love it when Phyllis makes a pound cake. I love a pound cake. I really, I mean, you can look at me and tell I love a lot of things. Um, but I love a pound cake. And, uh, you know, it's fascinating to me. She'll take a pound of flour and a pound of butter and a pound of sugar. I think that's why they call it a pound cake. And they, you know, you take any one of those ingredients. Have you ever had just a spoonful of flour? Man, it's terrible. You want something to drink quickly, you know. Flour's not good by itself. I don't even like butter by itself. I love butter on bread and things like that, but just I never have once gone to the refrigerator and say, I'm just going to get me a big old spoonful of butter. You know, I don't do that. Even sugar, I love sweetened things, but I never go to the sugar container and just get a tablespoon of sugar. You see, those things aren't necessarily good by themselves, but when you mix them together and you bring in a lot of heat, under time, and you know, out comes something good. That's what God is saying. I mean, things that happen to us are not good, but God has a way of taking them and making something good out of it. That's, that's what we do. We thank him for those things. Now, uh, again, some of the things that happen to you are not good. And sometimes they're little things. You know, we, uh, <laughs> we worry and fret about little things. You know, anybody here ever worried about losing your car keys? I have. Anybody here ever misplaced your phone and you worry about it? I mean, little things. Look, I have worried about so many of those little things. And you know what? This week, I was worried because I found a bill. I am, I am judicious about paying my bills on time. As soon as it comes in, I pay my bill. And I found in my... Manila folder, a bill from Middle Tennessee, Middle Tennessee Natural Gas that was three days past due. And I had to pay the late fee. And I, I fretted, I, how did I do something so dumb? Why didn't I see that bill? I can't believe it. You know what it cost me? 50 cents. 
The late fee was 50 cents. In the summertime, we don't use much gas. You know, you heat, we heat with it in the winter. And, you know, it may be 150 or $200 in the winter, but it's 12 to $13 in the summer. So the late fee was 50 cents. And I thought, why am I wasting time worrying about that? I mean, so many of the things we worry about are so little. It's, it's ridiculous when you stop and think about it. We just don't need to do that. So you, you worry about nothing. You pray about all things, and you thank God for everything. But let me give you number four. You think on the best things. Now, notice the way he said it in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, uh, good repute, if there's any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Some translations say think on these things. Whether you think or dwell on it, that's the same concept. You, you think about the good things. You don't waste your time thinking about the bad things. Now, the fact of the matter is, you are what you think. Now, let me add something here. You may not be what you think you are. Some of you guys are not what you think you are, but you are what you think. <laughs> and we know that because Proverbs 23, 7 says it this way, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You are what you think. And folks, if you're thinking about unlovely things, you're going you're gonna to be unlovely. If your mind is set on impurity, your life will be impure. If that's all you think about. And you have to learn to control your thoughts. And some of you are sitting there thinking, preacher, I can't control my thoughts. Yes, you can, or he wouldn't have told you to. When he says, think on these things, dwell on these things, if that were not possible, he wouldn't have said do it. So don't tell me you can't do it. You can. You just have to control what you're thinking. And I want you to listen carefully. You will never have in your life the peace and the joy of the Lord. And, and this is hard to articulate, but let me say it this way. You'll never have that peace by not thinking about the, the wrong things. You know, let me say it again. You, you'll never have that peace by not thinking about the wrong things. I mean, sometimes we sit around and we think, well, I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to think about my sin. I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to think about that thing I said. I'm not going to think about what I did that was wrong. And you know what you do? You're thinking about the thing that you said, the thing that you did that was wrong. And you won't accomplish the peace of God by not thinking about the things that are wrong. The way you accomplish the peace of God is by thinking about the things that are right and lovely and pure. Actually, it's almost a good short description of Jesus. <laughs> I mean, he was all these things that you find in Philippians 4, 8. But you see, you, you control what you think. And it's not by saying, I'm not going to think about this. I mean, if I sit here and tell you, I don't want you to think about a pink elephant. Just don't think about a pink elephant. For the next five seconds, don't think about a pink elephant. You're going to be sitting there thinking about a pink elephant. And that's not the way you do this. You learn to think positively about those things that are right and good. You displace the old way of thinking with the new way of thinking. That's, that's what he's saying, folks. And God has made you such that you can't think two thoughts at the same time. If you're thinking about things that are lovely and good and virtuous and pure, you won't be thinking about the things that are bad. You can't think two thoughts at one time, only one thought at a time. That's the way God made us. So, you know, be careful about how you think. And again, don't tell me that you can't do it. You can. Romans chapter 12, verse 21 says, Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? Good. Don't be overcome by evil. You overcome evil by good. Think about the good things. Two men looked through prison bars. One saw mud. The other saw stars. Just depends on what you want to think about, which way you want to look. Now, let me give you the fifth point. The fifth point is this. You do the right thing. Do the right thing. Now, notice the way he said it in verse 9. The things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these 
things. Do these things. You do the right thing. <laughs> now, draw a word, a circle around that little word practice or do, depending on which translation you have. You see, if you're inactive, just sitting around, going through morbid introspection, <laughs> it's no wonder you don't have peace. Sometimes you need to get off the couch and do some things. Did you know that coming to church can actually be harmful to you? Do you know that? I mean, if you hear these things and God prompts you to say, you need to do that. You need to use your gift in the body of Christ. You need to do this for your next door neighbor. And if God is very specific about what you need to do and you don't do it, do you know what's going to happen? You're going to become frustrated and depressed. Somebody said it this way. Impression without expression leads to depression. Sometimes you just need to get busy and do some things. Make sure they're the right things. <laughs> you, uh, you want to be careful to do those things that God leads you to do. Do you know what Jesus said as he approached his death? One of the things he told the disciples in John chapter 13, verse 17 is this. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Now think about that. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Do the right thing. That's what Jesus told his disciples. That's what Paul told the church at Philippi. And this is coming from a man who's talking about joy and peace while he's in jail, innocently, instead of sitting around <laughs> saying, woe is me, this is not right, this is not fair. Here is the Apostle Paul, who is, in fact, the little book of Philippians is called the joy book of the New Testament, because he talks a lot about joy in there. Having this joy, having this peace, is not dependent upon your circumstances, it's dependent upon you. And sometimes you just have to do some things. Now, what are the results of this peace? Well, first of all, and this is neat, the peace of God will guard you. Now, notice the way he said in verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, think of that for a moment. The peace of God will guard you. Fascinating when you really think about it. Just like that Roman soldier guarded the Apostle Paul, Paul said, God's peace guards me. Now, the world doesn't understand this at all. And it may not even make sense to you at first until you experience it. But God guards us. That, it's a military word. He garrisons, garrisons himself around us. He sets up a guard around us. And he protects us from those things. And we have a peace that the world just cannot understand. Because the peace of God guards us. Now, the world thinks that peace comes from being healthy, maybe having a large bank account, uh, good investments in the stock market. The world thinks peace comes like that. But we all know people, don't we, who by all standards are really well off, and yet they worry all the time. They're worried about keeping those things. So you don't have to worry about keeping this peace. It keeps you. That's the beauty of it. The, the peace of God guards you. Now, this is Paul in prison talking about joy and peace. No wonder the world can't comprehend it. Peace is not the subtraction of problems from your life. Otherwise, you wouldn't need a guard, would you? Don't expect God to remove all the problems. The problems will still be there. But you see, the beauty of this truth that I'm talking about this morning is this. God will give you victory in spite of those problems. He's provided a guard to protect you from those issues that you think would hurt you. The peace of God will guard you, but secondly, the God of peace will guide you. Now notice what he said in verse 9. The things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So the peace of God guards us. The God of peace guides us. Now, folks, if you've got God's peace and you've got God, what more do you need? I mean, if he's leading you step by step, what do you need in addition to that? You don't need a thing. You just need to enjoy what God has given you. 
Somebody said this. I, I thought it was good. I don't know who the author is or I would have credited him, him or her. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power, no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. And he will. But it depends upon you and your response to him. Some of us here are warriors. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And many times we worry about little things, which is so ridiculous. I can't believe I wasted one second worrying about 50 cent fines. But we tend to do that. We have to conscientiously think and bring our thought life back to reality. Because the reality is God is going to guard me God is going to guide me. I hope you see it. It's a tremendous truth that you can take with you today. Let's bow for prayer for a moment if we may. Heads bowed and eyes closed for a moment because some of you right now are going through stress, strain. The old devil may be whispering in your ear, thank you for listening. <laughs> you don't have to listen to him. What you ought to do is listen to God. Because God has just told you what to do. I hope right now you'll look to him and commit those issues, those problems, those stressful things, those things that cause you to worry, that make you anxious. Commit those things to him. You pray about it right now. Cast your burden upon him. And see what happens. Now it may be that some of you here have never really been saved. You may be religious. You may be a church member. But you've never given your heart to Christ. I'm talking about truths that are a blessing to those of us who have been saved. Who have been, who have been ones who have committed our lives to Christ. This is one of the benefits that we enjoy. But if you've never been saved, you can't enjoy the benefits of being in the family until you're in the family. And some of you need to give your heart to Christ this morning. Some of you need to say, Lord, I am such a sinner. I have been trying to do this on my own, and Lord, I can't do it. I want you to do for me what I can't do. I can't be good enough. Lord, I've tried. I've failed. I can't be a Christian. And some of you right now need to call out to him and say, oh, God, forgive me. Save me. Based upon Calvary's cross, I surrender all to you. Whatever the need right now, this is a time when we have just a moment of reflection about the truth of God's word. And how will you respond? That choice is yours. He'll not force you to do anything. But how will you respond? Father, I thank you so much that your word is alive and quick and sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, I pray that it really would divide down and pierce all the way down to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, that our very thoughts would be opened to us and we'd see really who we are. God, I pray right now you'd have your way in each heart, that we would leave here different men and women, that we would be victorious, and that we would have that abundant life that we've been thinking about for months. God, help us to live up to the things that you've given to us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Let me just remind you, as always, that, that we would love to talk to you about these things. If you want to talk about your relationship to Christ or, or, or some issue, we're, we're glad to help. Just let us know. We'll try to be there for you, okay? God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>